we keep you alive to serve this ship. So row well and live. <laughs> Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where each week we enter the world of a great film. We explore its themes, the history, the filmmaking, and the influence it has on us today. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roca. I'm a voiceover artist, host, writer, producer, um, and recently doing more voiceover on, if you want, on Crypt TV. You can see, so you can listen to some of my stuff I've been recently doing over on Crypt TV. Uh, two videos just came out for the Unsane, and then another one will be coming out. Maybe another couple will be coming out for A Quiet Place when that comes out. So, so wait, what is Crypt TV? Crypt TV is a it's like a website, I guess, where they talk about horror stuff and they talk about all this, uh, all these uh, horror films, which is ironic because, like I've said before, it's not my favorite genre, but. I've been. You've got the voice. Yes, yeah, so I've been very fortunate that a friend of mine works there and suggested me to them, and they asked me to do one uh, spot, which I did a few weeks ago, uh, and then uh, one of her friends uh, was like, "Well, uh, will he come and do more?" And I'm like, "Absolutely!" So we worked out a, a you know a rate for me to do it, and they sent me these four incredible fun scripts. It's challenging. Um, because you're having to shove in a lot of words in one minute. Oh yeah, and keep the and keep the vibe of the right. of, of your voice the whole time. So I usually send them six to seven takes of right. any copy I do, so that they can uh, adjust and and edit as they see fit. But it's been a bla- a very unexpected uh, blast, uh, professionally and also financially. So it's nice. Well, that's so. going to be very interesting. <laughs> but before we get to the film, yes. I have an announcement to make. Go ahead. So. Um, a lot of you, if you've listened to this show, you've heard me talk about Great White Sharks and The Great White Shark, my last film I did, Beyond the Cage of Fear with Mike Hoover, my yeah. partner, and how sad I was that that movie was not available in the United States. It's available. Yes! So if you want to watch my film, Great White Shark, Beyond the Cage of Fear, it is available on Amazon Prime. So you can, I believe, rent it through Amazon. And if you're a Prime member, it is free. Well, I have so, a Prime member, so I will watch it. So I, I'm really, really proud of the movie. We take a very, very different look at sharks. We explore it both in a scientific way, and then we also have, I think, more guys catching dorsal rides on the back of Great White Sharks than you have ever seen. There are critter cams, which means we mount a camera on the shark to see the world through his eyes. Yeah. We have Thad Lasinic, who's a world-famous animal trainer, who's coming to work and to see if we can actually train great white sharks. And believe it or not, there is a real fake mermaid that gets in the water with the great whites. Uh-oh. So this is Great White Shark, Beyond the Cage of Fear. I wrote, directed, and edited it. I even narrate it. Nice. And I would love to have you cinephiles come take a look at it. Um, so that's my that's the first ad for it ever, but I'm so excited that finally people in the United States get to see this film. There you go. Nice plug. Uh, okay, I don't do it that often. <laughs> no, I do it right. every once in a while. To get to the movie, a lot of people ask sometimes, like, how do you pick the movies that you pick? Yeah. And and the truth is, it is as unscientific and often random as possible. You know, sometimes it's because we get a lot of Patreon picks and we really want to do more yes. of our Patreon picks this year. Um, sometimes it's uh, our guest that's coming on and they request a certain kind of film. Sometimes, sadly, it's because somebody has passed away mm-hmm. or there's something, or there's a movie that's representing something that we want to hit on. Sometimes it's just yours and my whim. And then sometimes... Or anniversaries. Or anniversaries. Right. Yeah, that's another reason we might pick one. And then sometimes it's something that we picked... This one, literally over a year ago, Mm -hmm. we said next year at Easter, we're going to do Ben-Hur. And then it was was last week that I looked at the calendar and went, oh, it's Easter. (laughs) You're right. (laughs) Um, Wow. I had, Steve, I had totally forgotten that we had had that conversation because I think we'd missed it. We'd miss, and, we just missed it last year. Right. And I said, and I, and I think we just came up and we said like, well, because this is one of my favorite films. I know it is. And it's one we've seen in the theater together. That's right. Uh, once. And so, um, yeah, I remember having that conversation now. Son of well, God. that's why I put it in my <laughs> calendar and then suddenly it came yeah. up. And what's funny about it is that we've done a lot of epics lately. Yes, we have. Because we just finished Lawrence of Arabia mm-hmm. and we've got another epic in the can yes. that's going to be released fairly soon. Yeah. And so when we're done with this one, which has been her, <laughs> I think we got to get out of the epic business yeah. for a while. Maybe with some comedies, some sci fi, some, yeah. some other stuff. Maybe finally a Hitchcock, which everyone is clamoring for us to tackle. I know. We keep, so we need to do that. And we really want to. And those and of you who are requesting Hitchcock, we're, yeah. we're not avoiding it. It's just yeah. 
things just keep happening and we you know we go where we go yeah. but this this film is is first of all tied for the most oscar winners of all time with yep. 11 oscars including best picture um this is a big huge powerful charlton heston william wyler epic Ben Hur, do you remember how you first came to this film? Yeah, my dad and my mom sat me down to watch it when I was a kid. It was an Easter tradition. Right. So we would watch it uh, every Easter. Uh, we had it on, I think, VHS. And then eventually, when we got TCM, they would show it every Easter on TCM. And we saw it and we would watch it there. So I, I know I was a child. I know I sat down with my mom and dad and I watched it because we grew. I grew up in a very religious house. As Latino, you know, it was like a Catholicism was a big deal in our house. And so um, any movies that were Catholic based were given like a lot of attention in my house. Jesus of Nazareth, that TV right. movie. Yeah. Every year. And so this Ben-Hur and Jesus of Nazareth were the two things we'd watch on the weekends of Easter. Um, yeah, for me, it's very similar, although... Because the other movie that played at Easter mm. was The Ten Commandments. Yes, Ten and, Commandments as well. Yeah, because Easter and Passover is always around the same time. And this was, we've talked about it many times on the show, that you know when we grew up, there were these movies that played once a year. Yes. Like Wizard of Oz or Willy Wonka or The Ten Commandments. It's a big deal. Yeah, and th so those, of course, I watched... I watched Ten Commandments far more than I watched Ben Hur. Yeah, like I love Ten Commandments, and I did see Ben Hur probably around the same time, but not as much. And Ben Hur is a much heavier, more serious movie than The Ten Commandments. And it's funny as I grew older, I mean, I'd seen it several times, mm -hmm. but then I kind of realized Ten Commandments actually isn't that great a movie. It isn't, and because I loved it as a kid, of course. And I lumped Ben Hur with The Ten Commandments, and so I really didn't watch it. I don't remember how long it had been uh, since I'd watched it when you and I went to see it at the Cinerama Dome right. a few years ago. And then and I went, oh, no, I have not been given this movie the credit it deserves. It is an amazing film. It's a film that I watch uh, maybe more than I watch Lawrence of Arabia. And Lawrence of Arabia is a film I come back to a lot. Even And I think Citizen Kane is the only film I've ever watched more wow. uh, from beginning to end. And it's a film that moves me on so many ways. I'm no longer necessarily like religious or hardcore religious. I still believe in God and Jesus Christ, so it still affects me, the film. But it's more about the idea of redemption, the idea of, and as I get right. older, and you know, we all have our stories, we all have our mistakes we make in life and our, uh, our anger or our frustration or whatever that, you know, the, but what is so incredible about the film is it really does treat this very heavy concept of redemption. And it is a heavy concept of rede the redemption. Oh, yeah. uh, it does. It treats it in a way that's very powerful and moving and understandable. And it's it's maybe my favorite acting performance by Charlton Heston in any film uh, ever. And so, and it's a film that every single time I cry um, at the crucifixion, every single time. And I can't explain it. I don't know why, but there's something about it that when it happens, as it builds to the moment in the movie, that it just destroys me. And I love watching it over and over again. And I enjoy the, the score and the look. And it doesn't, to me, it doesn't slide into cheesiness. No, I agree. Be because there's so many good actors uh, giving life to these characters and these lines. Um, let's do a little bit of pre-production because this has a, a long history. It does. The, the, the first thing to know about uh, Ben Hur is that Judah Ben Hur is not a real person. No. There was no. He's not a character in the Bible. He's not. Has no historical nope. reference at all. This <laughs> character was invented by a Civil War general named Lew Wallace. Wow. Lew Wallace is the author of the book. He served under Grant mm -hmm. uh, in the Civil War. Apparently not the best of generals. No. Yeah, he was not one of the big guys. Grant wasn't a big fan of his. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, he he ended up being he was a judge. He was one of the judges of uh, the uh, of the assassination conspiracy of Abraham Lincoln. Oh wow, Judge Lew Wallace. And then he went on to be governor of the New Mexico Territory at the time when Billy the Kid was going around in the New Mexico Territory. What? So he was involved in the capture oh. and pursuit of Billy the Kid. Um, and then he. He started to write novels, first novel nobody ever heard of. Mm -hmm. His favorite book, apparently, is Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Great book. Which makes, and it makes perfect sense. Yeah. It's a revenge story about a guy who goes off on this long journey, gets lots of money, comes back with all this power to plot his revenge of yeah. this powerful figure. I mean, there's definitely a Count wow. of Monte Cristo element to uh, Ben-Hur. Absolutely. Um, and the book comes out, nobody is interested in it for about four years, and then it becomes one of the biggest selling books of all time. Wow. Yeah, I mean, this was a huge, huge, huge bestseller. 
And so a bunch of people came and said, we want to make a, a play, a Broadway play out of this. And oh, yes, <laughs> he resisted for a while. And finally, they agreed to do it. And this became the most successful stage play of all time. It ran for 20 years. It had chariot races on the stage. What? Like like it had three chariots with horses. It had a naval battle with galleys. I mean, this was a huge, huge spectacle. Oh. Ran 22 years and millions of people came to see this play. Wow. It has had not one, not two, but three movies made of it. Mm -hmm. The first movie was like a 15-minute silent film in 1907. Yep. And one of the interesting things about it, the guys that made the movie, they didn't get the copyright. They just went and made the movie. <laughs> the heirs of Lou Wallace sued them, and that is really where a lot of the copyright laws today what? protecting writers comes from was this case against Ben-Hur. And then the, the second film that was made was 1925. It's right at the end of the silent era. This is a huge production. One of the biggest silent films ever made. I mean, and if you've seen it, have you seen any of it? The Yeah, the, the, the Cherry Race. One, yes. Yeah. It's incredible. Amazing. Yes. It's an am I mean, like, it's a huge, huge film. And interestingly enough, one of the people that worked on it is a young assistant director named... William Wyler. <laughs> so he worked on it then. Um, and that was a big, huge hit. Um, and then we can go, you know, we can cut a little for forward to um, the 50s uh, when the studio system is really getting killed by TV. Yeah. And, and, and an example of this is that statistics in like 47 are that 90 million people would go to see movies twice a week mm. in the United States. And that's when the population was only like 150 million. Yeah. So everyone is going to see movies all the time. Four years later, 50 million people are going to see movies once a week. Wow. Yeah, that's how much TV is killing film. And that's part of why, so part of why, you know, in the early films, they're all four by three, which is the same size as an old fashioned television, standard yeah. definition television yeah. set. Part of the reason we got all these widescreen formats like CinemaScope and uh, Cinerama and Panorama and Panavision, all these, all these things mm -hmm. were to compete with TV. Makes sense. To give people an experience in the movie theater that they couldn't get at their homes, so they get the hell out of their house <laughs> and go see movies. And one of the, the studios that's really in the tank, really genuinely close to bankruptcy, is MGM. Hmm. MGM is in deep, deep trouble, and they've just done a thing where they've made a whole bunch of money, and it's stuck in Italy. And this is something that's happened in today, which is that for tax reasons, they can't bring their money back to the United States because they'd have to pay a whole bunch of taxes on it. So what do they do? They go... Well, let's just make a big movie, a huge budget movie in Italy, <laughs> yeah. and they make Quo Vadis. Oh, yeah. Quo Vadis. Yeah. Which I don't think I've ever seen. I have. It's boring. Okay. I apologize to anybody who loves that movie. but it So not uh, not coming soon on the cinephiles. No, I don't think Quo so. Quo Vadis. Um, and uh, so they make that, but it's a big hit. This might be boring. Yes. It's a big hit. And they yeah. go, man, let's go do it again. And that's how the subject of Ben-Hur comes up. Uh. And they bring on Sam Zimbalist, who's a very successful producer. Mm -hmm. He brings on William Wyler. I love, by the way, William Wyler's quote is, the only person that can make the best film about Jesus is obviously a Jew. <laughs> um, um, one thing I found out about William Wyler, you know what his real name is? No. Willie Wyler. Willie Wyler. Yes, his actual legal name wow. is Willie, and the studio said, that doesn't sound respectful enough. We're going to have to change that to William. Um, and the thing that he, that he wanted to, which I just is the opposite of every story you've ever heard, yep. the thing that he uh, wanted to do was... He wanted to make a movie in every genre. That's what he really wanted. Love that. And so he made horror movies and romantic movies and dramas. You know, this guy who made Best Year of Our Lives and Weathering Heights, yeah. Roman Holiday, Rebecca. He's going all over the... And the one that he hadn't done is an epic. Yeah. So that's why he took the job. Also, they paid him a million dollars. Well, and also he had done it in the 20s. So maybe there was a little bit of a, yeah. an emotional attachment for him as well. Very possible. And this isn't the last version. You mentioned the first version. I'm sorry, you're there correct. Is a, there is a remake that came out last year. Did you see it? It was horrible. I didn't, horrible. Didn't, even, didn't even occur to me go see it. Yeah. I, good actors, Toby Cabell and uh, uh, Houston, uh, for Jack Houston. But Lord God, was it a terrible remake of, a, of an incredible film. And I don't know why you would ever try to... I don't, I don't know it. why you'd ever try it. to master an epic. It just makes no sense. The epics are epics for a reason. The timing of them, when they came out, and the things we watched as a kid, learning and discovering and loving films. Well, and the thing that you can bring this into one. is not crazy. Particularly this one, it's like, what is it that you have to say? Yeah, what are you going to bring to it that William Wyler didn't bring to it in the 50s? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there are other things. Like, I remember, this is a silly example, but I remember it's not an epic. Yeah. But I remember we went to see the remake of RoboCop. 
And part oh, yeah. and part of the reason that I wanted to go see it was I was like, that's a perfect movie to remake. Absolutely. Because there's so much interesting things you can say about it with where today's mm-hmm. you know, the social media and where the world has gone and our relationship to government and police and all these things. It's like, oh, all sorts of new stuff to talk about. It's a terrible movie. It was. But but I understand why you might want to redo it. Ben Hur, I can't I no yeah. idea. It's no. like it's been done. Mm-hmm. Um MGM had 40 different scripts for this movie. <sighs> trying to figure out how to do it. Finally, Weiler picks a script by a guy named Carl Tunberg, but he still isn't satisfied. So he's out in Rome mm-hmm. shooting the film, and he first brings in Gore Vidal, mm-hmm. the oh. brilliant, erudite, fascinating, complicated Gore Vidal, <laughs> the old, who he didn't want to do this movie at all. He thought it was stupid. And MGM came to him. He was under contract with MGM as a screenwriter at the time, and he said, I'll do it under one condition. And they said, what? He said, you let me out of my four-year contract. And they said, okay. Oh, wow. So he did this. And then at a certain point, he and, seems like he and Weiler had a falling out. And they bring in another writer named Christopher uh, Fry. Um, and they're rewriting through the whole process, which, you know, as we talked about many times, that's rough. Yeah. Heston was not the first choice. Ooh. Not even close. The first choice was Paul Newman. Wow. Yeah. I could see that. But I bet, he, I bet he was hesitant because Silver Chalice is not one of his... That's why he didn't do it. Yeah, is it really? Yeah, he yeah. said, he said I'm never doing that again. Yeah, he hated Silver um, Chalice. The next person they wanted was Brando. Oh. <laughs> then Kirk Douglas, who I totally could see. Kirk, I could see. Kirk would have killed it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Rock Hudson. Yeah. Um, and then none of those people wanted to do it, so they actually did an open casting call. Oh, my God. So they're just bringing in people off the street to play Ben-Hur. Ah. At that time, they had had Heston to play Masala. Oh. And and uh, William huh. Wyler had worked with Heston on I think it's Big Country, mm-hmm. um, and then said, "Oh wait a minute, maybe Chuck can do it." And then they finally switched it over and brought Makes Charles sense. Heston in. Um, yeah, but it's a, so and we got to say like big, huge movies, big money. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that's going to go into getting them made. And I don't know that Heston's. I don't know how many times Heston's ever played a villain. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, nothing leaps to mind necessarily. Like Fonda you, was incredible when, sure. once upon a time in the West. West yeah. But I, I don't know if Heston's ever really played a villain. It would have been interesting to see I think him he'd play be a villain. good villain. Yeah. I think he'd be a really good villain. Yeah, he's got that sneer to him. Shall we jump into the movie? Yeah, please. It's an epic, so let's start with an overture. <laughs> As we should. And we see that it's Anno Domini. Yes. Yeah. Um, and we, we begin with, as you should do in many epics, Roman epics with some narration, mm-hmm. explaining that there's this census and everybody has to go to Rome. Great. Or, I'm sorry, everyone has to go to Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, and I love the way it's, it's so straightforward. Yeah. Um, and we have a, a big shot of the temple in Jerusalem and the crowds coming in. By the way, Charlton Heston's in that shot. What? Yeah, because they, that's actually was shot for him arriving back in Jerusalem <laughs> after. And it's so long. It's such a wide shot. You don't really notice yeah. it. But he's in there. He's in there. Um, and we see um, a man and a wom- a man walking in with a woman on his donkey. And it is Joseph from Nazareth. Yeah. We don't even say the woman's name. Nope. Don't need to. Nope, that's what's so what what I, that's what's so smart about this movie that, is they know that you know, mm-hmm. and so they just hint at little things mm-hmm. and expect you to fill in the rest. I think that is brilliant. I agree. Yeah, we cut to some stars, mm-hmm. and we see the star. It is pretty easy to follow. Yeah, it, and we see th- we meet our three wise men. Mm-hmm. Well, and by the way, in the Bible, there's no mention of how many wise men there are, <laughs> and their names are not given. So all of this stuff is added later. Uh, in fact, in the Eastern tradition, there were probably 12 wise men. And the reason they picked three wise men was because they had three gifts. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So some some stuff that people think is the truth is like, eh, maybe not. <laughs> um, but they go in and, and it's beautifully shot as the shepherds turn in. Mm-hmm. We hear the sound of the baby. Everyone turns and bows. It's a beautifully, perfectly done major scene. It really is. Um, yeah. And there's the blowing of the shofar and the star fades. And then that shofar sound is changed to a Roman fanfare. And now we have Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ by General Lou Wallace. He kept that general title around. I would too. Sure, of course. Yeah, you'll, you'll earn it. It's interesting to me, by the way, that the image that we see is the Sistine Chapel. Mm. Um, because that is the the creation story. That's mm-hmm. Genesis. It's mm-hmm. not the Jesus story at all. Right. But 
you know, you can't beat Michelangelo. No, and it's biblical stuff. And ironically, uh, Heston would play Michelangelo later on. Oh, that's a great, that's a great, great point. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about that. All these things are connected, man. You're right. Um, it's AD 26, mm -hmm. and we see the Roman legions appear, and you'll notice they're always in red. Yes. So it's red is very strong. We don't see red anywhere except with the Roman legions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we go back to this carpenter. And immediately we know, again, as you say, where we are. Yeah. That this is Joseph. Um, and I, I think it's just a, such a good touch, by the way, that they have the mezuzah on the door. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and, and by the way, when they first shot it, the guy didn't touch the mezuzah when he entered. Mm -hmm. And they had a, a, a Jewish rabbi, a scholar, who said, no, no, he would have to touch that before he came in. And they reshot it. Wow. They also had a, a, a guy from the Vatican who was a scholar and a Protestant scholar because there was a lot of pressure to get this right. <laughs> good. Yeah. Uh, which I, I really admire. And I love the, the dialogue. He says, my table's not finished. Where's your son? He's walking in the hills. Mm-hmm. He neglects his work, Joseph. No. Once I reproached him with forgetting his work, he said to me, I must be about my father's business. Then why isn't he here, working? And of course, we know why. Yeah. <sighs> And we see Jesus from a distance. Yeah, I'm getting emotional again. Yeah, go ahead. What gets you about this? I don't. Can you? I just have a very strong connection to the story of Christ. A very strong connection to Christ, and yeah. uh, there's just something about it. I, I I wish I could put it into words, Steve. I wish I could uh, uh, give you a window into it. But something about it. There's a. You know, when you've been through the stuff I've been through, when you've kind of had the wars with yourself about religion and about your place in that world and also when you grow up in a very religious household also had to kind of deal with all of that it takes on a certain significance and when you've sought uh forgiveness and redemption and resolution for the uh, the stuff you experienced as a young man and the stuff you went through um you feel a a love for the character of christ because of him dying for our sins because of what he went through. And this is my belief, right? Of course, I, I know you're Jewish. I'm. This is my belief. And, and so I have a very strong emotional connection to him because of what he represents, the possibility of redemption, the possibility of walking into the kingdom of heaven and being able to let go of all of it once and for all. And so it's a very powerful thing. And I think uh, Weiler does an incredible job, as you said earlier, of alluding to things, of showing this, like you don't have to, like we don't even see Christ's face until way later in the movie. You, you don't just, ever see it. You, you never see it. Well, in, on the when he's carrying, you see it through the blood. And Maybe, the, yeah. But, beard, but, you don't it's, really, but it's not real, right? Yeah, you don't ever shot. really see it. Exactly. And I that love that. I love that. And so when he, this conversation between this carpenter and this guy, that's exactly what, you could imagine a conversation like that happening, yeah. right? And the way Joseph does he goes i reproached him once it's real simple it's not yeah. judgmental it's simple and he says well he says but well, i have to be about my father's business and it's like whoa and it's yeah. just so strong and because you know joseph is the unsung hero of the entire story of of uh, mary and christ and all of this joseph is the unsung hero because joseph never complains he accepts what mary yep. says to him and carries on it's just incredible well no i mean well the thing is sorry to rattle on and on not a, i don't i no i think this is important because this story, the Christ story, is so interwoven mm -hmm. with what we're going to experience. And it's funny, as a Jewish guy and an atheist, mm. I'm drawn to that story too, because it is a great story. Yeah. And it's funny, with uh, Jax, as I've introduced him to various ideas of religion, I find it much easier to tell the, him the story of Christianity mm. than the story of Judaism, right. because the story of Christianity is very clearly linked to a, a perfect story about this one character, yeah. the character of Jesus of Nazareth. Whereas the story of the Jews is Abraham and Isaac and Joseph and Samson and David and Solomon and Moses and all of these people. Right. You know, and it's complicated. It's extensive. It's extensive. And it's yeah. and it doesn't it it doesn't lend itself so easily to clear interpretation mm -hmm. as the story of Jesus does. It's like I think it's like British history versus American history, right? If you start with George Washington, you can go from there. Right. But in British history, it's so many different kings, right. We're with queens. The, with the Romans and, yeah. and invasions Because the Jewish faith the was around for, for centuries. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Whereas, whereas the key moment in Christianity happens in about 30 years. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. So, but then we end up at Jerusalem and we, and we really meet Masala Stephen Boyd. Yeah. Um, who really came from nowhere. Really? He's like an Irish actor. He'd been a model. He hadn't done a lot. Wow. Um, and... Uh, one of the interesting things, by the way, is so Weiler casts him, he really likes him, and then he realizes, oh, Masala has blue eyes. 
Charlton Heston has blue eyes. A whole bunch of people in this movie have blue eyes. And so he made uh, Stephen Boyd wear brown contact lenses. And this is in the early days of this stuff. Can't even imagine. He could barely see, really? and it really messed up his eyes. Wow. Like, there were days where he just couldn't work the next day because his eyes were so pain in so much pain. Wow. Yeah. Um, uh, so we find out that Masala, who's talking to Sextus, who's mm -hmm. the Tribune who's replacing, he's like, he wanted to be, he can wait to get back here. Mm -hmm. And Sextus is like, look, things are rough here. I tell you, there are strange forces at work here. For instance, there's this Messiah business. I know, I know. There was one predicted when I was a boy. A king of the Jews who will lead them all into some sort of anti-Roman paradise. <laughs> Makes your head spin. And there's a wild man in the desert named John who drowns people in water. There's a carpenter's son who goes around doing magic tricks. Miracles, they call them. There's always some sort of rabble-rouser going about stirring up trouble. And Masala doesn't seem to care that much, but Sextus, you can tell, has been kind of going, mm -hmm. well, this is interesting. No, 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 this man is different. He teaches that God is near in every man. <laughs> it's actually quite profound, some of it. And it's clear that the, the message of Jesus has gotten even to, to the Tribune of mm -hmm. Rome. Mm -hmm. And there were many Romans, you know, who were affected by this story. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, and, and a couple hundred years later, you know, the emperor. Yes. You know, by the time we get to Constantine. That's true. Um, uh, but Masala's having none of it. He's like, you've been away from Rome too long. <laughs> Go out back to Rome, take a bath. You know, you'll get rid of all this the stuff. The hubris of a young man, dude. That's yeah. the way it is, yeah. you know? And, and in the middle of their conversation, there's a servant that comes and says that there's a Jew outside, says he's a prince. Um, and Masala's response is, then treat him like one. Yeah. Um, and he even says, this was his country before it was ours. Don't forget that. What a surprising moment of respect. Well, this moment, right? I think we like Masala. Yes. You know, He's, that's why this is here. That's why it's so interesting when the turn happens, because the setup here is a real connection, a real understanding. And there is the tragedy of the relationship. That's what's so brilliant about the film. Well, and I think the, part of the key is he's, the next thing he says is you ask how to find an idea. I'll tell you how with another idea. Mm. What I think is that Masala has a plan, and that plan involves the cooperation of his best friend, Judah Ben-Hur. Absolutely. So he wants him to be treated like a prince because he thinks, I have a prince on my side, and that means I have a prince on Rome's side. Yes. That's what he thinks is about to happen, and so I think it's time to meet Judah Ben-Hur. It's an amazing shot, this first shot. Down this long hallway... Ben-Hur is perfectly framed in the shadows. I mean, it's it's beautiful and they approach and they embrace and you could see the love yeah. between these two men. I said I'd come back. I never thought you would. Have you heard some of the stuff of what Gore Vidal has said about Masala? If you, no. Well, it depends on what you're saying. Um, so Gore Vidal's having a real hard time writing this character. Mm -hmm. And what he finally comes up with was that that Masala and Ben-Hur had some kind of romantic connection. Yes, this I've heard, which Heston has rejected for years, but I believe it. And, and the way it's portrayed in the film, it feels very much like there was a very powerful romantic connection between them. Here, here's what I... Th 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 this totally or a speculative. bromance, a bromance. Well, like certainly I think that's there. Here's, here's what I... So... And what I would say, too, based on watching these characters, is that Masala's feelings and Judah Ben-Hur's feelings are not exactly the same. Yes. Um, that's the first thing I would say. In terms of how this went, came down, and I don't know this, mm -hmm. but what I think, Gore Vidal believed this, and he wrote to it. Mm -hmm. That's how he wrote it. He told William Wyler this, and, I and that's true. Mm -hmm. My belief, and I don't know this, is that William Wyler told Stephen Boyd and did not tell oh, Charlton Heston. Certainly possible. That's what I bet happened. Hmm. And so Heston is acting it his way with his truth, and Boyd is acting in a different way with his truth, and that's what's creating all this weird stuff. <laughs> that's great. But it does it's almost sub, it's almost subconscious when you're watching it, Steve. Right. Something is happening here that you're not quite a hundred percent aware of, but you sense something, right? Some yeah. core of interest, some some connection that's further than friendship. It is a deep, deep connection, mm -hmm. and their joy at seeing each other. I mean, they actually kind of giggle, yeah, as they're talking, and that they he, almost become kids again. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think they they really do. Yeah. He says that he drank a toast when he heard he'd become Tribune. Right. We ask about the mother and and the sister, and they can't wait to see him. We get the sense that maybe the sister is actually in love with Masala. Yes. yes. And then they see the spears. Yeah. And Masala goes, you know, it's kind of like 
you want to do this? <laughs> and Masala picks up a spear and he throws it down the hallway to lodge at the, you know, the, the meeting of these two beams. And then Heston throws his spear. I think hits it just a little bit more yeah, to the yeah. center. Well, just a little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit. Those spears, by the way, are on wires. That's how they did this move. No surprise. But it looks great. It yeah. looks really good. And, and, there's this, and there's this moment of like, after all these years, there's still like the connection... I'm sure you've had this with a friend you haven't oh, seen in a decade. Of course. And you walk back and you just start right up again. I have two friends from Virginia I've known since I was 15 years old. Uh, one friend I don't talk to maybe once, twice a year. Whenever I go home for Christmas, it's like I never left. Yeah. And it's great. Those are the, those are real good friendships. Yeah. But also what's interesting here, Steve, with the, the spears and everything that's occurring with them uh, is this camaraderie that we they're giving to us by just interacting. We right. we get a window into this this uh, probably decades long two decades at least long friendship between them uh, just from their interaction. Yep. We don't need exposition. We get that he loves his Masala's family. I mean, uh, uh, Ben Hur's family. We get this all this strong connection going through, and it's it's great. It's a great way to introduce them. But also, the slight you do see that the the how would I say this the outer edges of Tension, the jealousy yeah. of the yeah. jealousy yeah. from Masala's side. Especially after the spear thing, because Ben Hur does beat him by just that just little, little bit. bit. Yeah. Well, and 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 we introduce the the tension which is building, which is that, you know, he's saying like it's going to be a difficult to govern a promise. I'm going to need your help. Yeah. And advice. And Ben Hur's advice is, withdraw your legions. Give us our freedom. And and then this response is great. He's like, well, unfortunately, the emperor needs his empire, <laughs> uh, and he's fond of Judea, to which. Ben Hur's response is, Judea is not fond of the emperor. And then Masala says, oh, Is there anything so sad as unrequited love? <laughs> and uh, that's, yeah, there's a lot of levels to what, uh, you know, because yeah. I think he has unrequited love for Ben, for Judah. Yeah. You know, uh, we go into Masala's quarters, which are pretty grim. And Masala says, There's more legions coming. And the rumors are true. The emperor does not approve of your countrymen. There is rebellion in the wind. It will be crushed. And this is the split. This is the yeah. conflict. Is yes, they are friends, but also their people, to some degree, are enemies yeah. that Rome has conquered. He, and Masala basically says that fate chose us. Fate chose Rome to rule the world. Mm. I have real problems with people that say things like that. Hmm. I mean, anytime you get into the Pax Romana or Manifest Destiny sure. or the Third Reich... Anytime you believe that destiny has said that you should be in charge, that's when people start doing some terrible, terrible stuff. Yes. And the next thing that comes out of his mouth is... To to persuade your people that their resistance to Rome is stupid. It is worse than stupid, futile. For it can end in only one way, extinction for your people. And it's interesting to me, this movie comes out, you know, 14 years after the end of World War II. Mm. You know? Very like, good point. I don't think you could talk about this movie. There are two historical things that I do not think you can separate this movie. One is the Holocaust, yeah, and the other is the f the formation of the State of Israel, mm -hmm. which happened ten years ago, right? Ten years before this movie is made. Mm -hmm. They're they're just really very very fresh in the world right now. And so when you say the extinction of the Jews, that's some that's some heavy stuff. Yep. Yeah, especially if a Jewish man is directing the film. Of that's course. right. Yeah, um, but. Ben Hur's stance is, I'm against violence. Yes. I'm not one of the rebels. I preach nonviolence. Mm -hmm. I preach cooperation. You know, I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not resisting you. Yeah. And then they have this toast in the classic, have you ever done the cross-arm toast? Maybe drunk. I think you and I need to do this more often. <laughs> I think it's very sure. masculine. Yes, but I don't know if it, it would bode well considering how things turned out in the movie. Fair. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> Especially for me, the non-Jew. No, I don't yeah. want to have I don't want to have a, be run over by horses. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um and, and they and they basically end with like we've got to stay together. Yeah. And we cut then we cut to those two spears stuck into the wall. Yeah. Steve, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. And at this point now, we've talked about Ten Commandments. This has been her both starring Charlton Heston. Yes. You grew up Jewish. These are Jewish stories because Jewish leads in both of these stories. What was it like for you? Because he's like statuesque and tall and blue eyed and thin and in shape. And he's the lead of these films. Like, did you see him as this kind of Jewish hero for you growing up? Did your dad present it that way? What was this like for you? It's funny that you asked this question mm. because this is something I've been thinking about 
all throughout this movie. Wow. I've been thinking a lot about it. I have a note later to bring up sort of this exact thing. So okay. yes, I'm glad you asked this. Here, here's what I think. I think it is a remarkable thing, particularly in Ben Hur, not mm. as much in Ten Commandments, to have Charlton Heston be a Jew. Mm. And here's what I was thinking about this. So if you talk about the Old Testament or the Torah, those stories are stories that you and I share. Yes. Right? So everyone who is a Christian, or in, in a lot of ways, everyone who's a Muslim, mm. can believe, can feel their connection to Moses. Yes. Is that Moses is sort of, because all of our stories, that's where the Ten Commandments come from. Moses is a prophet within Islam, is a pro, you know, is a, mm -hmm. an important man in whether you're a Baptist or a Lutheran or a Christian or a Jew, we all share that. And so the fact that Moses can be this heroic, tall, and frankly, Aryan guy, mm -hmm. you know, we all go, that's okay. There's an interesting thing that I, and this is what the thing I've been thinking about a lot, is mm -hmm. that when you talk about Jews before Christ, one usually refers to them as Hebrews. Oh. That Moses was not there to free the Jews, he was freeing the Hebrews. Hmm. Post-Jesus, and after the diaspora, we tend to refer to them as Jews. And the image of Jews post-diaspora, you know, after the Romans spread the right. Jews all over the world, we really get to Shylock. You know what I mean? Right. Like From all of the images yeah. are, they're first of all, for the next 1800 years or so, they're largely negative. They're all yeah. weak. They're intellectual. They're, you know, they're the big nose, slim, bearded, dark haired people. Mm -hmm. And then throughout the 20th century, you know, there are lots of Im images of, of Jews, but none of them are big, strong, heroic guys. Right. And there's something profoundly different to me about Charlton Heston saying, I am a Jew in the time of Jesus and Rome from Charlton Heston being Moses in the Ten Commandments. Hmm. Because now it isn't the characters owning a Hebrew that we're all descended from, it's the characters owning a guy who's clearly a Jew. Right. You know, although we can assume that he becomes a Christian, you hmm. know, in, in as the early Christians are. Sure. But he's very much a casting the Jewish people as heroic in a way that I don't think they are cast that way. Hmm. Throughout, so it, it was a profound. I think it is a profound thing, and it's also it's also interesting. By the way, one more thing is mm -hmm. that you know it's like there's so many blonde haired, blue eyed Romans mm -hmm. that speak with British accents in the history of film. Yes. You know, and so it's like even though they probably didn't really look that way, <laughs> and Jesus has always been per portrayed as a brown haired white guy. Yeah, which probably that's not what he looked like. No, you know, and so the fact that we're getting that treatment, the Jews, mm -hmm. you know, in a, in one way it's kind of disrespectful, and in another way. It's super respectful because it's saying you're one of us. You're hero. You Jews are heroic, just like Charlton Heston. Right. So yeah, I had okay. a lot of thoughts about that, and I'm okay. really glad you asked that question. Sure. Um, so let's go back to Ben Hur's house. Yeah. Nice place. Yes, very nice place. Lives he's a prince. A really, yeah, he's like a prince. Yeah. We meet his mom, Miriam and Tirza, um, and this is his mom is Martha Scott. She played Moses's mom in the Ten Commandments. Oh yes. Yeah. Um, Biological mom. Biological mom. Right. Yeah. Uh, the one who put him in the in the basket in the yes. river. Um, and uh, this is actually a reshoot. They had another woman playing his mom, and they didn't like her, and oh. they brought this one in. Kathy O'Donnell, whose real name is Ann Steely, mm -hmm. plays Tierza. She was actually discovered at Schwab's Pharmacy <laughs> at Hollywood and Vine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? She, uh, um, she has a bit of a tragic story as an actress as well. Uh, I don't know. what the I know she was William Wyler's sister-in-law. Yeah. What happened to it, her? It became, uh, well, she couldn't quite break through. And it became a source of difficulty for her as she got older. And mm. she died young, oh, like right. early 50s, late 40s, oh, something wow. like that. So it was not um, it was not a happy transition into the world of films. She right. couldn't quite cross over, uh, even with something as incredible. As and she's so sweet in this film. Oh, yeah. And so uh, just so such a perfect sister. She's a perfect yeah. sister. And you want to cheer for her and yeah. you want her to have her redemption as well. Yeah. yeah. So Masala shows up. And immediately he's talking about the conquering of Libya, I think it is, yeah, and how they destroyed it and they left nothing but ashes. And now he's in Judea, and there's some real darkness about what the Romans do. Yeah, they're happy to see him, but as he goes into these tales, they're also like nervous and unsettled because this could happen to them. There is that undercurrent of it all, right? And he's just talking about it like it's no big deal because to they, that's a foreign country. He, it would never happen here in his mind because he doesn't anticipate that these people would go against him. He doesn't well, think it would be possible. I'd frame it quite slightly differently. Okay. I think it's because he's Rome. 
you know, uh, and that Libya was against Rome. Right. And there's definitely, because what did he say in the last scene? The extinction of your people. Yeah. I think he, he does see it as as he is from Rome, mm-hmm. and he therefore has the divine right to do what he's ever he's got to do. I guess you're right. But Ben-Hur still loves him, and he yeah. gives him a beautiful horse. Yeah. Um, and as we're talking about this horse, which Masala is very touched to get, he asks Ben-Hur, hey, did you talk to your dudes? And he says, yes, I talked to them. Most people agree with me. Um, and he goes, okay, who didn't agree? This is where the turn happens. Oh, yeah. This is where it all begins. Yeah. Yep. And and there's that moment of Judah looking at him like, what are you asking me? Yeah. Like- and he says, yes, I am asking you to essentially name names. Mm-hmm. Yes, Judah. Who are they? Would I retain your friendship if I became an informer? To tell me the names of criminals is hardly informing. They're not criminals, Masala. They're patriots. Patriots. Yeah, like Patriots! Who? And we could see Masala like getting mad. Mm-hmm. And his response is, look, the emperor is watching. And if I do this right, then I'll go up and you'll go up and we'll be powerful together. This is the dream that he had yep. for him and his buddy, Judah Ben-Hur. Yes. And he can't believe that Judah's not just going, yeah, sounds great. Steve, how close are we to the House of Un-American Activities? This is 1959. Right in the middle. Right. I think this is also tied in, too. What you no mentioned, question. the first two things, uh, the Holocaust and the construction of israel as a yeah. nation i think also the house of american activities is here too with the red scare and this idea of naming names what's well, funny you should mention that another actor sam jaffe who plays simonides mm-hmm. who we're going to meet in a minute mm-hmm. he's a blacklisted actor oh. that weiler cast despite the blacklist because they were in rome and he could get away with it and right so i think you're absolutely right yeah this is definitely a naming names moment mm-hmm. and judah says i would do anything for you except betray my people in the name of all the gods, Judah, what do the lives of a few Jews mean to you? He thinks he's speaking uh, Judah's language, the language of the elevated, the language of the elite, right? He can say this to him because Judah is a prince. He's not yeah. working a regular job, right. carpenter, so to speak, like Joseph right. is. He's a prince. Therefore, in his mind, he's like, this is collateral damage to peace. Yeah. And he thinks he's speaking in an elevated, but Judah has a stronger connection to his people. And, and you see that when we start, both of them are kind of tiptoeing a little bit around. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say the worst stuff, but we get pretty pretty much there, right? You know, because mm-hmm. Masala basically disparages, you know, Ju- Judah talks about the Jews and their future, which he believes in. And Masala's like, they have no future. Mm-hmm. You know, Ro- you know, Rome is the future. And then Judah says, I tell you, the day Rome falls, there will be a shout of freedom such as the world has never heard before. It's just an impassioned delivery of that yeah. line. Um, and it's interesting, too, because in general, I would say most portrayal of Rome that we've seen in important literature and in film, mm-hmm. they're the good guys. Yeah. You know, because we, and it's such an interesting thing that there are certain conquerors, like Julius Caesar, who essentially we like, mm-hmm. you know, even though they, you know, killed all sorts of people and conquered all sorts of lands for the glory of Rome. Mm-hmm. And there's certain ones like Napoleon or Genghis Khan that we really don't like. Yeah. Even though they conquered all sorts of people and we just sort of cast them as good guys. And here, suddenly, the Rome, Rome is being cast as the bad guys. Yeah. You know, because we're suddenly with the Jews, which, as I said before, is kind of profound to me. Yeah, starting to turn. Spartacus, same thing happens. Spartacus is the next year. Yeah. Oh, that's a great point. Uh-huh. So yeah. That's starting to happen. Yeah. Um, and Masal's response to this is, Either you help me or oppose me. You have no other choice. Mm. You're either for me or against me. There's a long, long pause and a great (laughs) close-up with Chuck Heston's great intense face. And his response is, If that is the choice, then I am against you. Once again, Masala, can I get from Judah what he has wanted to get from him? Since the beginning. Well, and, and I think, <laughs> I think too, he spent 10, I don't we know how many years away, 10, 15 years away. Right. And I think he's been turning over exactly what's going to happen with Judah in his head over and over Great and over point. again. And Judah does not stick to the script. Yeah. And you've had that. I've had that where you sure. like, this is how this conversation is supposed to go. Right. You're not supposed to say this here. <laughs> and it just went off the rails. Do you think Judah, when when he heard, this is fun for us to play the hypothetical, do you think Judah, when he heard Masala was going to come back, he was happy about this because he Absolutely. thought there could be peace here, that, there, that if anyone is going to understand his people and understand what his people needs, 
It's Masala well, who and, lived here. Well, and it would is they're both up. operating. They're both operating from love on some degree, yeah. but off of a false premise. So, so Judah believes Masala loves me and my family. I am Jewish. Yeah. Therefore, through us, he must love the Jewish people. Right. Masala believes Judah loves me. Therefore, he must love Rome and be more Roman and not be so Jewish. Great point. You know, and yeah. because of that. That is not actually what's going on, mm -hmm. and they get in deep, deep trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and then Judah has to go back to his mother and sister and say, Masala ain't coming. Yeah. Um, and again, when he puts on a yarmulke and he says the prayer over the bread, and it's, it feels very Jewish to me. So I, that's why I have this reaction, you know? That's great. And we go off to visit, we just mentioned before, Simonides, who's Sam Jaffe. He's a really interesting guy, by the way. He has a degree in engineering. He, he became a math teacher, and he started doing theater... And he became a buddy of John Huston. Oh, wow. He, he played Gunga Din in George Stevens's original Gunga Din. Really? With, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, he's Gunga Din. He was blacklisted, as I said, and uh, William Waller brings him back in. And they have a great relationship. It is clearly a deeply loving, respectful relationship. Mm -hmm. Simonides is both his slave, yeah. but doesn't really treat it like a slave, right. and his real man of business. Um, he's his Alfred. Totally, that's who he <laughs> it's is. It's Alfred, right? Yes, it's I love it. That is Batman. exactly who he is. Yeah. Um, and and we hear about his daughter Esther, mm -hmm. who is technically also a slave. Yeah. Um, and and and, and what Heston hears that he's like, "What? Come on, she's not, you know." Yeah. And they realize she's got to be a young woman, and in walks Esther, mm -hmm. who is a higher heresy. Mm -hmm. She's Israeli. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. There we go. She's actually the only foreigner who's playing a Jew. The way they did it, basically all the Brits are playing the Romans. Right. And all the Americans are playing Jews, except for Haya Heresy. She was served in the Israeli military. I mean, she's, you know. Wow. Uh, yeah, she's a real deal. It's Gal Gadot before Gal Gadot. Yeah. And like we, hear, we hear the love theme. Yeah. And, you know, there's something you could do in movies where <laughs> two people look at each other and you're like, oh, they love each other. Yeah, yeah. That's it. These are the only cheesy moments in the movie, I think. The romance between them at mo at times. And her acting in certain moments. The breathy stuff that she does a little bit. Look, we're... But it's the know, 50s, man. Well, and you know how we said, like, okay, we're watching a kung fu movie. You have to... It is yes. a certain kind of movie. Absolutely. Is this movie cheesy? Sure. But it is what it is. This yeah. is a big, biblical, big emotion, big feeling, mm -hmm. big music epic yeah and so it doesn't seem inappropriate to me no. it is it is what it is yeah it is what it is um and they have this you know she's about to get married and she needs his permission and we get very clearly she doesn't know this guy but we get very clearly also that he is immediately smitten with her oh yeah and vice oh, versa yeah. um he gives her permission to marry uh and then we end up upstairs in his house in this beautiful room with these screens that's very recognizable yeah. and uh Esther is kind of saying goodbye to the city, and she. I guess they played together as kids. Yeah, she was there when Judah was injured, and and Masala brought him back to the house, and she prayed to God to save Judah's life. Mm -hmm. So they got a big old connection. Yeah, and then Heston says this thing, which, look, <laughs> it's a weird thing to say. Yes, and in today's world, it's particularly a weird weird thing because he says, you know, in the. Old wise days of Solomon, if that was among his slaves, some girl who filled his eyes, he could choose her out from the rest and take her to him. Wise days of Solomon. <laughs> <laughs> I understand what they were trying to do, and it's 1959. Right, but right. That ain't that ain't sexy. Well, if you're looking for if you're looking for progressive thought back then, no, dude, you're looking this at is the wrong place, yeah. wrong thing to say. But then the next moment is great, where she says, "If you were not a bride, I should kiss you goodbye." If I were not a bride. There would be no goodbyes to be said. I love that writing. That's mm -hmm. some good writing. I like it a lot. And and what and then and then you know he takes her hand. He takes off her slave ring and he puts the slave ring on himself. And she says, "You will wear it until you meet the woman you will marry." And he says, "Yes." And then he kisses her. And here's my question for you. Yeah. Why aren't they just getting married? What's because, the obstacle? Well, I think because she's a slave, he's a prince. 
That also exists the other way around too. Sure. And also, I think because uh, maybe um, this is an arranged marriage, and there's a tradition about. I don't know. You're the Jewish guy. Do you tell me? Maybe there's an arranged well, look, marriage look, here, I, and, so you can't violate those things. <laughs> I'm a born in the '60s San Francisco Reformed <laughs> Jewish guy. I'm not a, a year, right. you know, thirteen <laughs> living in Jerusalem Jewish guy. <laughs> so, so then maybe it is I don't know the that. rules here, but well, it's so weird because. It's pretty clear that every Simonides would be happy, mm-hmm. Esther would be happy, Chuck would be happy. We all kind of get. Yeah, but then you don't have a movie. You don't that, have the, well, that is the reason. Yeah, yeah. The exactly. reason is is we don't have a movie. But what's really great too about this moment it is it reaffirms the goodness of Judah because Judy Judah willingly gives her his f- yes her freedom right as her wedding gift. Yeah, and that's great. He doesn't have to. Well, and it makes me wonder, powerful. like, why didn't you give Simonides your freedom? I mean, he treats him that way. Yeah, just I mean, it's... It is, yeah. Look, it is, it's a movie. It yeah. is what it is. And also, like, what would be the point? Yeah. The new governor has arrived, mm-hmm. and it's time to have a procession through the city. And we kind of hint at the fact that, you know, Jerusalem's not all that happy about him being there. Right. And they, they kind of go out on this march, and uh, Judah and his sister are up on the roof looking mm-hmm. down. She sees Masala. She's very excited. Yeah. Uh, and as she leans over, we see the tiles start to slip. And immediately you're like, uh, it's not going to. Shit. Yeah, exactly. It's not going to go well. It's great foreshadowing. And then he, uh, the governor appears. She runs back over to the corner, leans over. Tiles shatter. They slide off the roof, knock down, scare the horse. The horse rears, knocks him into a wall. The governor is out. Yeah. Oh, crap. The centurions are charging, trying to get in the house. Judah, they run downstairs. Judah tells uh, Tirza, like, don't say anything. Yeah. Just say nothing. In come the, the Romans. Doesn't he tell them to let them in, too? He yeah, he lets them in. He lets yeah. them in. In come the Romans, and he says, it was an accident. I did it, which is really important, is he takes the blame. Yes. And they're kind of grabbing him, and they're going to arrest him. And in comes Masala. Thank God Masala's here. Masala will believe me. In the name of God, tell them it's a mistake. I leaned on the tile and it broke loose. It was an accident. Saul looks at him and says nothing. Mm-hmm. And they take Judah away. And right there, his mom and his sister know that Masala, what side Masala has chosen very powerfully. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Masala's up on that roof. And yeah, he, that son of a bitch. Yeah. He goes up there and he sees that Judah is telling the truth by by because he pushes on the tiles and the tiles go. So he knows that it could have been an accident. And he willfully, and this is where Masala is evil at this point. He oh, yeah. willfully uh refuses to uh save Judah in this situation because Judah went against him yep. uh in the early conversations. By the way, that's a reshoot. Oh, they did was not in the original script. They went and shot that later, and I think it's so important. So important, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yep. So Judah's in prison in the dungeons, mm-hmm. and the guards come and say, "You're going to go to Tyrus," and immediately Judah's like, "I'm going to die in the galleys. There's no trial." Um, he tries to ask about his mom and sister. They're not telling him. Yeah. He tries to escape. They kind of knock him on the head, mm-hmm. and then we're carrying him down the stairs, and he comes to, and it's some good badass escape. Yeah. Yeah. Runs down this. By the way, apparently Chuck Heston had dreams of falling downstairs through his whole life. Wow. Yeah. And then he gets to this and he was kind of freaked out because he's tied up and he's got to run down these stone stairs. And uh, and he says, this is, you know, I like Heston's stories. Yeah. He says he never had that bad dream again oh. after this moment. Oh, okay. Yeah. That this cured him of it. Thank he kind you. of breaks the wooden thing that's mm-hmm. holding him. Um, he goes into the, finds himself in the spear room, grabs a spear, charges into... Um, yeah. Where Masala is, yeah. threatens him with the spear. The other guards leave him and Masala alone. Mm-hmm. And this is the moment where Judah, he can't quite believe that his old friend Masala is really going to do this. Because mm-hmm. there's a moment where he kind of puts the spear down. Yes. Where I'm kind of like, dude, you can't trust this guy. This right. guy's evil. Um, and he, you know, he asks where his mother and sister are. And, and we find out the governor's not going to die, so neither are the mother and the sister. Um, and he says, I didn't try to kill the governor. And Masala's like, I know. No. You were evil. No, oh, Judah, I am not evil. I wanted your help. Now you've given it to me. By making this example of you, I discourage treason. By condemning without hesitation an old friend, I shall be feared. <sighs> mm-hmm. Man, that's evil. Mm-hmm. That's some evil shit. Well, and there's the difference, right? Because if if 
Judah does throw the spear at Masala, he is no better than Masala at right. that point, even though he has every right to do it. For the purposes of the movie, it would destroy the feeling of him being the good protagonist in the movie. And he can't do it because it's well, and Masala, not a bad person. There's another reason. And Masala knows. Well, and Masala tells him, though, right. if you kill me, your mom and your sister are dead. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's why he can't do it, too. Yeah. And that, that and then Judah just gives in at that point. Yeah, he throws the spear at yeah. the wall. Yeah. And then but he does have a good, a badass last line. May God grant me vengeance. I will pray that you live till I return. To which Masala's response is Return. And they take him away. Simonides and Esther visit the Tribune and they beg for Judah and Miriam's safety, and Masala arrests Simonides. We're in the desert. By the way, this shot of the you know the, the slaves, the prisoners marching through the desert, this was shot before Charlton Heston was even hired. Wow. And so the tall guy in the long shot, the wide shot far away in the distance, that's not Heston. That's some, some tall guy. Interesting. Um, and then for the inserts, we, we cut to Heston. They were originally going to shoot it in Libya, but when the Muslim government found out what they were making, they kicked them out. So this is shot in Israel. Wow. Um, and, you know, we're out in the desert and people are dying and they just throw the dead bodies down the hill. Judah's having a really tough time. Mm -hmm. And... As they approach a village, we hear the sound of sawing. Mm -hmm. And immediately we know where we are. You know, that's great, great storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, a young man puts down the saw. It's not Joseph, it's some other man. And we call waters for, water for the soldiers, soldiers first. And then water for the horses, horses before the slaves. And then they start to give water to the slaves and they don't give water to Judah. Mm -hmm. No water for him. Judah even tries to drink the drips yeah. that are coming off of he's so thirsty and by the way apparently on this set no water for him became what you said when anybody screwed up <laughs> you know so someone tripped over a cable it's like oh no water for him that's brilliant yeah and then judah goes down and prays god help me and i think he's going to die yes like if if, if jesus doesn't appear absolutely this is the end of judah ben Hur. god help me and a hand helps him up and helps him to drink. And you see from behind, and you see it in the shadows on the yep. ground. That's right. And it's symbolic, because he's not only given him water, he's given him the will to live. And it's symbolic because for a lot of people, Christ does that. For a lot of people, Christ of course. is the quencher of that thirst of the desire to live, desire to find purpose in life and him and then when he stands my, I tell you Steve that's one of my favorite damn moments in the movie when Christ stands up right as that Roman uh, guy is about to knock the uh, knock, uh, whip him or knock the water out of his hand he stands up and the look on this actor's face who does this moment is incredible because you're only going off what that actor is yep. giving you not what the guy you don't see christ's face at all that actor has to give you everything that's happening and his stopping and then almost ashamed that he was going yep. to do that's incredible so incredible and it shows you the power of christ or as it's told in the bible the power that christ had over the romans at times certain romans at times and how christianity was able to spread because it couldn't have just spread through the jewish it had to also spread through the people in power and so you see that it's possible and in that moment that's what always strikes me about his because then he just puts his eyes to the ground and he moves away and it's it's a shame because he understands he is part of an evil regime and this man has shown him the error of his ways just in that moment. It's really powerful. I think it's a perfect filmmaking moment. Mm -hmm. And because it's very clear, this guy is forever changed. Yes. Something has shifted in him and he doesn't know what it is. And the same is true for Judah. Mm -hmm. You know, Judah stands up and he is looking back. And this moment has, yeah. as we will see in the film, he never forgets this moment. Mm -hmm. It has changed him. By the way, just on a silly note, apparently William Wyler did not like the way Chuck Heston drank water, and he made him do take after take after take. And I don't know what exactly he was like, what do you want from him? But he didn't like it. Um, oh, you directors. I know, we're assholes. Um, well, it, it's really fun because I tell this to my class, my students all the time, yeah. is that you know your job as a director is to make sure that you get what you want. Mm -hmm. 
and there is a lot there are a lot of choices where you have to go i have to compromise for money for time for budget for emotion of your sure. actors and you go like ah, i'm not going to push and then there's certain moments where you actually have to say nope we're going to stay until we get this right yeah and and knowing which is the which one is which that's part of what being a good director is mm. you know and the music man we have the we have a light motif for jesus a theme for him it is triumphant and it's just a it's just a powerful film moment. Let's touch it. Let's go to the galleys. <laughs> I'll tell you what struck me watching it this time. Yeah. The fact that this is a real thing from history, that thousands and thousands of men were chained to oars as slaves and galleys for centuries is amazing to me. Yeah. And it really does show to me, and I thought this several times in this film, you know what? Things are pretty messed up in the world sometimes. But we come a long way. Well, we have in this country. In other countries, maybe not so much. And that's the unfortunate truth. I would say... In most countries, most of the people, we've actually come a long way. Sure. There's a great book, uh, Steven Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, mm -hmm. which is just a long description of the progress in humanity and like how likely are you in the world today to die from violence, to die from torture, to die from... Oh, sure. And the numbers are just really, really small when they used to be really, really big. Right. Um, we have actually come a long way. But you're, but certainly, as you say, there are a lot of places that are pretty rough. Just because you're not chained to a galley doesn't mean you're not chained to a lower, lower class system because Definitely of true. the economic Definitely decisions true. by people in power. Yeah, and so that's the thing. It's like, yes, we're no longer chained to galleys, but in some ways, we are slaves to uh, the economic system because people in power pass legislation, pass rules that keep us or keep people in the third, the lower classes, in the lower classes, un uneducated and only able to make a certain amount of money, living a very difficult and life deep, And deeply purpose. in debt. And, and deeply in and debt. All struggling of them. with bills yep. and healthcare costs. And yep. I agree with you 100%, but still better be, than being chained to an oar in a galley. True, it's true. Being chained to an oar in a galley. <laughs> you know, that is really bad. There's no TV there. Yeah, no. It's true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, you know, body to body with a bunch of smelly guys. Yeah. You know, you know that's, it's bad. It's, it's, it's such, yeah. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, this was mostly shot in a big, huge tank outside of Rome. <laughs> they had a couple of full-size Roman galleys and the rest were miniatures, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and we have, there's Chuck Heston, rowing those oars and in walks our friend jack hawkins yes which i had i always forget that this is him in this oh movie. really yeah because oh, i haven't yeah. seen it as much as you that's true um jack hawkins who we talked about in lawrence of arabia great actor he plays quintus arius mm -hmm. and he is the consul he's the new admiral essentially in charge of the roman fleet mm -hmm. and he kind of surveys the roamer the the rowers and he sees one guy oh he's ill oh we'll replace him and we kind of go oh maybe this guy's going to be compassionate and then and then another is like he sees a guy who has whip you know scars on his mm -hmm. back and he goes oh this man is giving you trouble that will stop like this guy is a mix yeah of being intelligent and interesting and completely hard he he's sees a, judah he's a tough love guy <laughs> he's, yeah he's tough something <laughs> um he sees judah and he's inter and he's immediately interested in him asks him you know how long have you been here a month less a day in this ship you keep an exact account and before three years in other ships it's a long time in a galley and this is a way of doing an exposition that isn't exposition oh no it's just organically in the process of the movie and a conversation well and it's filled with meaning too yes. i think that's what we're learning more about him than just a number of days and mm -hmm. months and years mm -hmm. uh arius walks away we think he's done and he whips him for no reason except to test him. Just to see. Just to see. If for three years, if his, will, if, his, if his will has been broken, right. will he fight? And what he sees is that he turns, wants to fight, and then stops. Mm -hmm. And and what Arius says is, you have the spirit to fight back, but the good sense to control it. Your eyes are full of hate, 41, which is his number. Mm -hmm. That's good. Hate keeps a man alive. It gives him strength. This is a profound statement about Judah Ben-Hur in this mm -hmm. moment. Hate does keep you alive for a while. It's true. <laughs> Um, and what does uh, Arius say next? We keep you alive to serve this ship. So row well and live. That's a great line. It is. 
Later on, Arius comes down, and all I can say is he's basically coming down to test the crew. Mm -hmm. He comes down, he watches the rowers. Yeah. He says to, and now I know what he's called, the Horator. Mm -hmm. The Horator is the guy that pounds the drum. Yeah. He says, battle speed. Battle speed! Oh, I love that. And they start rowing. And the, the score is great here, too. Oh, yeah. The music is great. A very clear, there's a very clear theme associated with the, the, the rowers. And then he says, attack speed. Yeah. Attack speed. Attack speed! And by the way, what they're pulling, to give it strength of pulling, they're pulling against elastic bands. So outside the ship, oh. each oar is tapped attached to a heavy elastic band so there's resistance so they're really Every rowing so they're really rowing <laughs> well and you know this from acting is that if you yeah. go here pick up this heavy suitcase and it's empty it's very hard to act like it's heavy yeah you know you need kind of the real stuff true um and and now he goes he goes to attack speed and then he goes to ramming, ramming. speed yeah, yeah. ramming speed And you could see that from there's the like the, kind of the second in command who's yep. watching that this is really crazy. Mm -hmm. And you see the rowers start to struggle. They start to cough. Mm -hmm. They start to collapse. I mean, they're going full sprint now. And and Arius is just watching them. And finally, he lets them rest. Right. Because, I mean, the next is ludicrous speed. And you don't want to go You don't want to go to ludicrous speed. <laughs> with, 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 so, so two things about this. So the first thing is yeah. from a commander's point of view... I think his actions in this moment make perfect sense. Absolutely. If you got on any ship, you would go, we need to test out the ship. Mm -hmm. We had to go to attack speed. We have to test the engines. We have to test the sails. Mm -hmm. We have to test our... That's perfectly normal uh, commander. Well, I want to know what I have. I got to know what I have. Coaches do this with teams all the time. Of course. Yeah. But when you have slaves, you know, chained to oars, kind of cruel. Right. The other thing I was thinking about is this movie came out in 1959. Mm -hmm. Animal House comes out in 1978. <laughs> but takes place in 1962. And when they're in the cake, they go to ramming speed. Oh. <laughs> and that's clearly a reference oh, to Ben-Hur. Very good point, yeah. Steve. Yeah. And of ramming course, I knew. Speed. I think I knew ramming speed more from Animal House yeah, than I did from sure. Ben-Hur, because I watched that movie over and over and over. <laughs> ramming speed. Um, back in Aries's cabin, he's asleep. And who should enter but Judah Ben-Hur? Mm -hmm. And he scares him. Oh, yeah. Because he, he called too. for him, but he forgot that he called for him. And he's asleep when and this he's asleep, yeah. Huge, and I have to say, as, as shirt off men go in the pre Arnold era, <laughs> yeah. Chuck Heston looks good. Yeah. And I was thinking, man, can you imagine if, he, if, if there was a young Chuck Heston cast in a superhero movie today oh. with modern training techniques and modern nutrition and whatever other things they might use? Uh, he would be a superhero. There's no way he's not Superman. There's no oh way my God. he's not Superman. Yeah. Or Thor. Yeah, Thor's possible as yeah. well. I yeah. mean, he's he's a powerful looking dude. Yeah. And they have a conversation with Arius about, hey, I, I run a bunch of gladiators and charioteers. Maybe you'd want to be one of them. Hmm. And he's like, no, my God has a purpose for me. And he says, you know, there's two people who are condemned with me, my mother and my sister. And Arius is like, look, dude, <laughs> you're you're chained to an oar here. Yeah. I'm offering you a way out. You should really think about it. And again, we get in this idea of Judah's faith in God, that God has a purpose for him. And as far as Aries concerns, are God of these little statues I pray to. Yeah. They have no effect on anything, and neither does your God. Um, and that's an important theme throughout the film. Mm -hmm. He sends it back to his oars because the enemy's in sight. Why do you think... Now, of course, narratively, it makes sense because it's the movie and he's the lead. But why do you think... What do you think Aries sees in... In 41, what do you think he sees in Judah like that makes him take a particular shine to him? Well, I mean, he, I think it's exactly what he says. He says he runs gladiators and charioteers. And he clearly, when he mm. walks in, he clearly spots him right away. And if you look at all those guys in the galley, I mean, yeah, Charlton Heston looks a lot different. He's yeah. bigger. And the, and one, the interesting thing, too, yeah. all the other people are kind of scrawny. Yeah. And he's a big dude. And he never looks down. No. Nope. That's one of the key things. Mm -hmm. And even after the exhausting ramming speed, his head is still up and yep. he's staring right that's, at Ares. You know, you want a dude that's going to be able to fight in the arena or a dude that can run that charioteer. You need that competitive, tough edge. So I think he sees that right away. Very good point. Yeah. Um, we're setting up for the battle. It's funny, uh, from what I've read, we know a lot less about Roman 
naval battles than we do about land battles. Oh. From what I've seen, there's just not as much research about them. Mm. It sounds pretty damn scary, these galley battles. Sure. Um, we're starting to chain up the slaves. And, you know, one of the slaves is freaking out. I wouldn't want to be chained to an oar in the bottom of a ship in the middle of a battle. This seems like a terrible, <laughs> terrible thing to have happen. And Arius tells the guard, don't chain 41. Mm. And they're going around chaining the, all the people. And the guard gets to 41. And here's just, again, this is a very small filmmaking thing. You'll notice that the guard grabs the link of chain at uh, Judah's ankle. Mm -hmm. And he flicks it, but doesn't put the chain through it. Right. And the reason that you flick it, I'm sure, I'm 100% sure this comes from William Wyler, is that the dark chain against the dark link against the dark ankle isn't that visible. And so uh -huh. in order for the audience to see it, you need a little bit of movement. So you give the guard the direction, hey, just move that a little bit so mm -hmm. the audience sees it. And of course, also Judah sees that he hasn't been chained. It's like, yeah. why has this happened? Yeah, because someone asked him, the next slave yeah. to next slave to master. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. And you know what music you hear when he says i don't know why i wasn't yeah it's the it's the christ cue isn't it's it It's the christ thing yeah yeah a very good use of a light motif mm -hmm. 41 why did he do that i don't know once before a man helped me i didn't know why then no more speed the battle has started um, this is a great battle, man. It's a really good battle. Oh, love it. Um, it's funny. The one thing you do notice when you look at miniatures is that one of the problems with miniatures and water is that so in order to make the waves look big, you shoot the miniatures in slow motion. Did you know this? No, I didn't. Yeah, because if you think about if I have a 10-foot wave crashing, it takes a certain amount of time for the 10-foot wave to crash down to the water. Yeah. If I have a one-inch wave, it takes it goes really fast. Mm -hmm. And so that one-inch wave, when you scale it up, doesn't look like the 10-foot wave because it crashes too fast. So you mm -hmm. slow everything down. Interesting. Um, so, so everything's in slow motion to make it look bigger. Mm -hmm. But this is just a small thing, but water droplets have a certain size. Yep. Yep. And so the water drops are too big yep. for the galley. They should be like spray, but they're actually quite big. Yeah, you know, There's something that. always with water miniatures that isn't quite as convincing as, you know, big, huge, other kind of miniatures. Right. But the battle is still really cool and really scary. We do go to ramming speed. We ram another ship. And then here comes a ship to ram them. Mm -hmm. And they see it coming through like the porthole, essentially. And they really ram two ships into each other. Oh. And that's real water pouring in. Holy and, shit. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, like, it, wow. they did it safely. No, right, hurt, right, right. But it's still pretty scary as they're running out. There's a dude who's missing a hand. That was just an extra who happened to show up with no hand. <laughs> and they're like, wait a minute. We'll just put some blood on that. We could use you. Um, yeah. Um, and the, the Macedonians, they, they board the ship. It's a crazy battle. Yeah. Chuck realizes he's free. He kills the guard, grabs the keys, unchains all the people. Yeah. He climbs up on deck just in time to see Arius in deep trouble. Yeah. He, Arius gets knocked overboard. Judah grabs a torch and pushes it in a dude's face. That looks like a scary stunt to me. Yeah. I don't know how you do that. Maybe you speed it up so it's not as scary, but it's scary either way. Well, it's like having, I mean, I'm sure they have like, you know, yeah. something on the guy's face to protect him from the flames, but that's a lot of flames going right in your face. Yeah, that's true. That seems hard. And then Chuck uh, dives overboard and gets Arius onto a raft. Mm -hmm. um, and we see the burning ship in the distance, which is done with blue screen, by the way. Mm -hmm. And Ares looks up and he knows he's lost the battle. And what does he do? Tries to kill himself. Yep. Right away. And all all Judah can do is knock him out. Mm -hmm. It's the next day. Apparently, by the way, Jack Hawkins and Charlton Heston are floating on this raft in the middle of this huge tank all day for several days for oh a long time gosh. so they would have to send a boat out with sandwiches and stuff for them i mean it was they were out there for a long time and uh, well, they got to know each other really well. i'm sure they did and uh Ares wakes up he's in chains because mm -hmm. charlton has to judah's chained him up and and the irony and he's like why did you save me and judah's response is why did you leave me unchained mm -hmm. and he begs him to let him die and, and what is ben hur's response we keep you alive to serve this ship. Grow well and live. <laughs> that is great. Yeah. My man lives for the vengeance. My yeah. man lives for the vengeance. Yeah. But well, except this one's weird because his vengeance is saving this guy's life. 
You know, it's right. not vengeance. It's it's some... no, but I, what he says to him. That's, oh, it's, absolutely, it's a nice little vengeance. Take. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then they see a ship in the distance. Yeah, is it? And one of, they don't know if it's Roman or not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and 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 uh, Ares's response is, "You better hope it's the Macedonians, because then we both get what we want. You get your freedom, and I get my death." Right, um, but it's not. It's Roman, mm -hmm. and this is an important moment. Is that at this moment, if Judah goes back to the Roman ship, his only expectation is that he gets put back in the galley. Right. And yet he chooses to call out. He's still a good man. He's a good man. Even with everything, yep. he's still a good man. He's Absolutely. A noble man. Absolutely. And they're on the Roman galley. Mm. And what do we find out is that, well, they won. Yeah. It's a triumph. And this takes Arius a while to process because he had been convinced that he had lost, that he should mm -hmm. die. And mm -hmm. he finally accepts it. And he says to Judah, In his eagerness to save you, your God has also saved the Roman fleet. And then he gives Judah the first cup of water. Yeah. Water is so symbolic in this film. Mm -hmm. It is so important. And, and Arius puts his arm around Judah and they walk away. Mm -hmm. That is an amazing transition. In full view. Yeah. In full view of the Romans. And, and the one other thing that we see is there's a shot from below yeah, man. of the slaves in the galley silhouetted with Judah looking down at them and we hear that same theme of the rowers and him, like, what does that feel like? This is a shot that uh, I go back and forth on all the time when it happens in the movie because one of the hardest things to accept in this world is that some people are just chosen for whatever reason. They're just chosen. He's chosen for whatever reason. Oh, yeah. And so when you see that moment from, a, from below through the window there, you, even Judah, I think Judah knows it too. And Judah has always suspected it. Now it's ironic to say that because of course the Jewish, the chosen people is the moniker sure. for Jewish people, but like even more so. He's even more chosen than the chosen people. And it's when he's looking down, I think he sees that because in other ways, he'd be like, unchain them or whatever. He'd do something to push the boundaries of what he's got. But his mission is something else at this point. Well, and so. I think, you know, there's that sort of there but for the grace of God. Yeah. Like, that's me. That I, I, could, I could be there for the rest of my life and die there. Right. I'm so close to that. Well, and the other thing that's happening, I think, and of course, he is chosen. Yeah. I mean, Jesus saved his life. That's what I'm saying. I mean, there's no, you know, in this film, he's yeah. clearly chosen. The But the, the weird dance this movie has to do is to condemn Rome, but not too much. Right. You know, is that this movie is not a battle against the evil Romans. Right. Although they are to some degree portrayed as evil. Yeah. You know, it's like they've got these slaves down in the galley and crucifying people and all the things they do. Right. And Arius is the is the pinnacle of this because he is both a, a brutalizer of slaves and a killer of, you know, other armies. Mm-hmm. And a guy we like. Yeah. You know? And and, and a guy that uh, Judah is going to come to love. Well, and I think this is a really good point, Steve, because General Lew Wallace, yeah. having served in the Civil War, there's a difference between generals who do it from a bloodlust place or use it to uh, stroke their ego, as we saw with McClellan in the Civil War, right. versus peop people who do it... Uh, because they have to, because they're good at it, and because they know they're the best to do it, and they achieve it, but they don't achieve it with any sense of trying to, trying to carry out some bloodlust. And I think he might have seen this with Grant. Grant sacrificed so many of his soldiers in his battles, but the job was to end the war, and that's what his goal was. And we see this with Ares. Ares. He's in the system. He works in the system. He does what needs to be done. And yes, did he test the rowers or whatever? But that's him figuring out how strong his army is so that he can go about winning the war. It's just logical. But he does not do it from a place of evil. You don't sense evil in areas. And in fact, when he wants to kill himself on the raft, it is because it is the shame of not having accomplished the goal that he wanted to accomplish. There is no way Masala would ever kill himself, no matter what. And there's the difference, you know? Well, and this is what's, what's, what's really hard is, as a general rule, all war is evil. Sure. But fighting a war to stop evil is not. Right. But in fighting your war to stop evil, you might have to do some shit that's evil. Right. You know what I mean? Like, like innocents are going to die. Yeah. And so any general is facing that dichotomy. Mm -hmm. And what's hard, the difference with Masala is he does some straight up evil stuff. Yeah. You know? And, and, and this is the other thing too, is like there could be a honorable 
great, family-loving, kind mm-hmm. soldier who works for the Third Reich. Robert E. Lee, you know, for the Civil War. Well, I mean, but but and again, and, and this also comes from what is our perspective? Yeah. Is that Robert E. Lee was a slave owner? Yes. You know, Thomas Jefferson is a slave owner, mm-hmm. and so how we reckon with these people Very good who did things that. Today we would find despicable, but also did things today that we find admirable Mm -hmm. and how we figure all this stuff out. And this is why I actually like the portrayal of the Romans in this movie, because they don't make them, you know, mustache twirling villains. Agreed, man. And they don't make them, uh, they don't make their hands clean. Yeah. You know, they are the people conquering all sorts of other people. And we do side with the people, the conquered people. Yeah. But not to the degree that we go, all Romans are terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, and at this moment, we we're going to arrive back in Rome, and suddenly we're on a chariot with Arius, and, and Judah Ben Hur is kind of dressed as a Roman, and there's a huge triumphant procession leading up to this stairway, and there is the emperor, who I think is Tiberius. Yeah, Tiberius. And Arius is getting honored by the emperor. He introduces his this guy who's apparently become the greatest charioteer in Rome. And what it must be for Judah. To be in this incredible place after everything he's gone through, to now be loved by Rome, celebrated by Rome. This was yeah. a man who was condemned by Rome. Right. How interesting. Well, and, and I think part of it is that Masala is the bad guy. Yes. Not so much not Rome. Rome, right. You know, not yet at least. Yeah. And uh, the emperor says, you know what? He's yours. You, we freed him. And we have a go to a big party that Arius is having. Mm-hmm. They spent a lot of money on this party. Yeah. Apparently shot the whole thing twice oh. because they didn't like, you know, there's like one end has the stage and one end has the fountain. And originally they shot it, everything down at the fountain end. And then they said, no, nah, I like the other direction better. And so they reversed the whole scene and shot it again. Wow. To get it right. We have these African dancers who are apparently, these are Le Ballet Africain, which Sam Zimbalist saw as this dance troupe in Paris. He's like, well, we got to get them. Wow. Um, they put a lot of, man, when you're making an epic... Yeah. You're going to make it big. Yeah. Uh, Judah's hanging out with this girl. Yes. Apparently there's something a little going on there. And Arius makes a speech. It basically says, when my son died, I thought my life was over. And now I have a new son. And he says, I'm going to adopt you. And you will be Arius. You will be the next Arius. And he takes off the big ring off his finger and sticks it on Judah Ben-Hur's finger, and I think Judah is genuinely touched. Absolutely. It feels real love for this guy. It's a strange destiny that brought me to a new life, a new home, a new father. It brought me here. It may take me away. But wherever I may be, I shall always try to wear this ring as a son of Arius should. Gratitude and affection and with honor. And then who else do we met, meet at this party? Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate. Who is played so well by this actor. Yeah, I forget his, I should have written down his name. I don't have his name. I love him in this movie. He does great. And and what's interesting, the portrayal of Pilate in this movie, fairly likable. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is your point, Steve. Yeah. Roman's not 100%. Yeah. And and we find out that you know he's got to go off to Judea because he's been made the governor there. Um, <laughs> his whole his whole conversation is an ug, yeah, a u g h. Oh, I have to go there and do these things. Oh, it's not. It's oh, I wish I could go someplace else. Well, and one thing that is true is that of all the 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 provinces that Rome concert, mm-hmm. conquered. Judea seems to have been a problem. Yes. There was a lot of... They took a disproportionate amount of Roman attention yeah. to deal with Herod and rebels and Masada and all these weird things that right. were going on. It right. took a lot of energy. Uh, Arius and Judah are alone. Yes. And kind of get to the, you're leaving. Mm-hmm. And he goes, yeah. And what's really sad about the scene is it becomes very clear that he's probably not coming back. No. Yeah. But Quintus Arius has a great perspective on the situation. Because as a father, he must understand that eventually the son must go and do his thing, just as he did. Yeah. And so it's, and you're right, Steve, what you brought up earlier, the fact that he's been the greatest charioteer, which means they've had some time in Rome together to build a relationship, a father-son relationship, and he's been, a, but he also understands that Judah is still a Jewish person. He was a prisoner. He was, he has his something mother and else. Sister. His mother and sister, right. Yeah, I mean, so can, there's a bigger yeah. goal here. And Quintus Arius, in his goodness, understands this and lets him go. Yep. And with the ring, which I think is great, the crest. Yep. It's just incredible. 
Judah takes a ship back. We end up at this oasis, mm. and Judah gets off a camel, and you could see his pride in coming home. Yeah. Um, and there we see Balthasar, yeah. our old wise man. Yes. And of course, we hear the theme again, and Balthasar's looking at Judah and trying to figure out who he is, and mm. Judah is pouring water on his face. Again, the significance of water. Yeah, purification. Yeah, and I think in this moment, he's he's he's... He's thinking about the water, and he looks at the ring in his finger, and there's sort of this double memory. Yes. One is the man who saved him in the desert, and the other is the woman that he loves. Mm -hmm. And Balthazar is kind of going, wait, is this Jesus? Because they're the same age. Right. There's definitely a thought there. And he comes back, and he talks to Judah about, you know, I got led by the star to see this kid, and that kid's probably grown up about now. He'd be about your age. Mm -hmm. And Balthazar says, I'm the guest of this sheik, who's uh, Sheik Ilderim. Mm -hmm. Uh, who's played by Hugh Griffith? A nice, not an Arab. Not an Arab. <laughs> by the way, that's some that's some bad blackface. Well, yes, it's but I not mean, good. No, but the Alec Guinness. I mean, like if we're gonna allow it a little bit, like we do with Alec in in I, in, I'm in Lawrence, which is a little easier in Lawrence. True. To be clear, I'm objecting to the makeup. Yeah, 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 yeah. The makeup is bad. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you say about that's fair. Like, you know, obviously they, they did not cast an Arab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was, you know, not at a time where people cared about casting someone from, you know, this mm -hmm. is a Welsh guy uh, who will win the best supporting actor yeah, for this role. He's, he's really good. Yeah. And we see that he's training some, a charioteer and some white horses mm -hmm. and Judah immediately goes, Oh, they're not going to hold that turn. There's no way they're going to do it. And they don't hold the turn. The charioteer is whipping the horses. She, the sheik comes down, jumps onto the back of the mm -hmm. chariot. And then we we end up talking with Balthasar. And Balthasar's like, hey, this guy predicted it. Yeah. And she, the sheik looks at uh, Judah's like, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> and he says, oh, well, I, I ra used to race in Circus Maximus. And he's like, oh, oh yeah. yeah. You raced in the... But, and this is correlative to Oliver Reed. This is There's correlations yeah. here to Oliver sure, Reed's character. Sure, I can see Gladiator. that. Yeah. And he invites Judah to dinner. Yeah. And he's kind of asking him, you're a Jew and you and you drove with the great circuses. And he's like, we might have achieved wonders together, but you got to go. Yes. And then there's the big burp. And, yes. And uh, Judah doesn't know to burp with him. And I love the scene. Um, and I have a question for you. Yes. When we did Lawrence of Arabia. Yes. You said that is the scene with Anthony Quinn about burping that led your mom to want mm -hmm. you to burp at meals. Mm -hmm. It's not this scene? It's. I think it was both of them in tandem. And, but you might be right. It might have been this scene Because this first. one's even clearer. Yeah. It might have, I think it might have been this scene first because of the whole encouraging him to burp. Yeah. Which isn't really necessarily does. in Lawrence. And so, you yeah. said you watched this every year. Yeah, we did. I bet you're right. I bet it yeah. was my I bet this was the scene that made my mom do it. Because my mom makes a joke about it all the time. It's so to funny. this day, she would make me By the way, if I burp. ever have did a meal with your mom. <laughs> You yeah. know I'm gonna burp. Yeah, but good. I absolutely will, especially if she's cooked the meal. I mean, she. she oh yeah, she, it was a tradition in her house as a joke all the time. Um, I love, by the way, <laughs> that Sheik Ildirim that he wipes his hand on the servant's uh, clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. A little detail, but very funny. Yes. Um, and and then he's and then he says, "Oh, I have to say goodnight to my beauties." And I think Judah thinks he's talking about his wives. Yes. But in come the white horses. <laughs> Apparently, Hugh Griffith was really scared of horses. Well, who wouldn't be? This? Yeah. The horses and, are incredible animals, but they are scary. Well, and this particular bit of animal training of without a trainer there, without any mm. reins on, nothing holding them, four horses, no one touching them together. This is really hard to do. I always think there's an element of improv in this scene. There is. Okay, I, there has good, to be. Because the horse hits him in the head yeah. and, or hits him in the back and he, you know, oh, yeah. you know, all of that. Um, and, and Judah says, I've never seen finer horses, not even in Rome. Mm. And then, and he says, oh, they're going to beat that champion Masala with his black horses. And immediately, yeah. <laughs> Judah goes, what'd what? you say? What? Masala in the circus. Yes. What, what was that? <laughs> I make him suffer? Hoppity, wait, I make him better? Hoppity suffers? Hoppity, hoppity, hoppity. <laughs> it's basically that moment. Yeah. Um, and, and, and man, Hugh Griffith sees it right away. Like, <laughs> oh, I got, I got something here. Knew him? I know him. Perhaps without much liking. Judah Ben Hur, my people are praying for a man who can drive their team to victory over Messala. You could be that man. You could be the one to stamp this Roman's arrogance into the sand of that arena. You've seen my horses. They need only a driver who is worthy of them, one who will rule them with love and not the whip. For such a man, they would outrace the wind. It's not possible. But that's not why Judah's here at this moment. Yeah. And the thing is, 
Shaquille Dream is, wants to go on. is like, it's not just defeat Masala because by defeating Masala, you symbolically defeat Rome. Yes. And that's not what Judah's about. Mm-hmm. He's not, does, he's not a rebel. He's a revenger. Right. Those are different things. Mm-hmm. Um, Which he's laid out from the beginning yeah. of the movie. Because he says, I'm going to deal with Masala in my own way. Yeah. And Balthasar says, your way is to kill him. Yeah. I see this terrible thing in your eyes, Judah ben But no matter what this man has done to you, you have no right to take his life. He will be punished inevitably. It's funny that even though he's only met the infant Christ, yeah. he still has this belief that all life is a miracle, mm-hmm. you know? And what do we hear then? We hear that theme, mm-hmm. you know, we hear that theme. And after, you know, and he says to, to Judah, you know, look, there are many paths for God to God, and I hope yours won't be too difficult. And then he leaves them alone. And, and she killed her and says, oh, well, he's a good man, but I'd rather keep my sword bright. You know what I mean? Like that's, he's a good character. Yes. And he gives him one last thought at the end. One last thought. There is no law in the arena. Many are killed. It's a great, it's a great setup. The ones who are successful at these kinds of businesses know exactly what buttons to push and when. Oh, yeah. On the people that can be influenced to their side. Yeah. And you see that here. Um, Judah arrives back in Jerusalem. Uh, I, I, I don't know the answer to this, but I'd be very mm. curious. We get to the house of her and it is a wreck and it's yeah. you know all falling apart and dusty and gross. I wonder which one they shot first because oh. sometimes it's easier to turn a distressed place beautiful yeah. than it is to distress a beautiful place. And I'd be very curious which one they did first, but it looks great. Mm-hmm. Um, and Judah hears something and there's Esther coming down the stairs. Um, and the cinematography is beautiful as he moves into the light. So he gets, yeah, it's Robert, Robert Surtees is the cinematographer. Mm-hmm. He calls her name and she just falls into his arm yeah. sobbing. And you know, she's been through so much. And she tells him that, that her father was imprisoned and he was tortured. And when he finally, they realize he's not going to tell him anything. They let him go. She's been taking care of him ever since they've been in hiding. It's incredible. He's still alive. Yeah. After all this time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jews are tough, man. <laughs> um, Fair. Um, and we find out, of course, she never went back to Antioch. There was nothing there. She never got married. Yeah. Um, he asks about the mother and sister and before she can answer, Simonides calls her Mm -hmm. and she goes, let me go warn him. So she goes in and tells him that Judah's alive. And this is a completely transformed man from what you saw before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Clearly he's been brutalized and Mm -hmm. then Judah enters and they embrace. This is a moving scene. Very moving scene. Very emotional scene. Cause he just, he's so happy to see him. You know, yeah. and he says like something like there's the sun of uh, light can come back into this house again or something like yeah. that by seeing Judah, you know, this, yeah. this belief. And then there's this big dude, yeah. big bald dude sort of behind that's Moloch. We met in the dungeons of the Citadel. We were released on the same day. Malak without a tongue and I without life in my legs. Since then, I have been his tongue and he has been my legs. Together we make a considerable man. <laughs> That's great. Even even in the depths of his pain, he still has. Yes, he's got which something. is why it's just why Jewish people are very funny. Yeah, you guys <laughs> have found the jokes within the darkness of the treatment or centuries that you've suffered in this world. You find the jokes. Well, you know, it's the only way to get through, man. <laughs> this <laughs> life funny. is life throws a lot of shit at you, and <laughs> life, if you can't get some jokes out of it, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, and apparently, he saved much of their fortune mm-hmm. because that's what the Romans were trying to get out of him, and he wouldn't tell them. Yeah. And he goes, "Well, I've come back to find Miriam and Tirza," and they go, "Man, four years in the dungeon, nobody could survive that. They have to be dead." And he says, well, who would survive more than one year in the galleys? Which is a fair mm-hmm. point. And then what Simonides said, which I love, is he says, you've come back like a returning faith. You have come back to us like a returning faith. Oh, Judah, I should like to laugh again. Yes, Let us laugh. We will laugh. There will be joy again in this house. We will celebrate among the dust and comrades. <laughs> and that scene is really profound yeah because me. because he speaks about what what he's been missing and i don't think he realized 
how much he was missing it because he wouldn't allow himself to have this yeah. vulnerable moment, this expression of it for fear that he could lose himself in the madness of it all. Yeah. And finally, he's able to let it out with Judah and have some belief that there is hope, there is possibility right. here that Judah survived and came back. My God, what that must be like. And Moloch, the big guy, comes over to pick mm -hmm. him up and carry him away. Yeah. And Judah says no, and Judah carries him away. Yeah. That'll make you cry. Yep. Every yeah, time. Every time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's 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 beautiful. And this is where it's interesting because this movie it does get quite dark. Yeah. But but at this moment, we feel hopeful, you know, and we see all the compassion coming out of yeah. Judah Ben Hur. Yep. Yeah. And a lot of that's gonna get destroyed. Judah and Esther end up in that same room yeah. with all the screens, and they basically repeat what they said four years ago. I was saying, if you were not a bride, I should kiss you goodbye. If I were not a bride, there would be no goodbyes to be said. not a bride and they kiss yeah. um then she sees he's still wearing the ring which he says has become a part of his hand yeah and then she thinks of masala and and as soon as she says the word masala you see his face change mm -hmm. and you see the thirst for vengeance um and she's like don't 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 go that way yeah i've seen too much of what hate can do but she's heard of this rabbi that says forgiveness is greater than hate. And this is what we talked about in the Gladiator podcast, the oh, right. difference between these two stories. There is always someone to tell Judah not to do this because he could lose himself in the darkness of revenge. Uh, whereas everyone encourages Maximus in the whole movie except for maybe Connie Nielsen to a degree, but everyone encourages him to seek this vengeance somehow, some right. way. Uh, and the best way to do it, they even offer him the best ways to do it. Right. Right. So, yeah. Well, in, in, in this movie, even though we hate Masala, yeah, sure, sure, sure. we would like vengeance too. Yeah. They, 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 they're not talking about Masala. They're talking about Judah's yes. soul. Yes. That's what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. and, they, and she says, stay, stay away from Masala. And he says, only if I can give up feeling and thinking. And, and then the response of, the stone that fell from this roof so long ago is still falling. Only this time you won't be sent to the galleys. This time you will be destroyed. You'll die. That's a beautiful poetic line. We go off to see Masala, who is practicing with a whip and drinking wine and... He, he's gone down a pathway in the last four years, I think. Of course, because he doesn't have the conscience of That's right. Judah. I would imagine Masala and Judah wrote letters to each other the whole time while Masala wasn't right. there. And I don't mean like when he was in the prison. I mean, before Masala came and became the governor of Judea, I imagine him. they were communicating regularly. And he probably offered him counsel and offered him the right way to think about things and encouraged him in, in other ways to look at it. Kind of like Schindler with with uh, Ray Fine's character right. in, in Schindler's List, trying to encourage him not to indulge in the evil instincts that he might have within him. Well, and I would add another thing to it is yeah. that before, he didn't have the sin of betraying his friend weighing on him. Right. And in the, in the construct of this film, just what we've been talking about with Judah, yeah. evil deeds corrupt your soul. Yes. You know, and here we see a corrupted Masala. And if we go to the further of the romance being there that Gore Vidal was talking about, he condemned his lover, condemned. potential lover, to yeah. this terrible death. Uh, but now he hears that Quintus Arius has given him a gift. And like, what? the Roman consul's here? Like, no, it's his son. And they give him this beautiful, magnificent dagger. Yeah. And he goes, oh, from a man I've never met. And then we hear, you're wrong, Masala. Oh. And, and it's in a way, it's really sort of an echo of the scene in the spear hall yes. where, where Heston appears and he walks in. And I love, by the way, he's got a Roman haircut now and he's wearing Roman yeah. clothes. It's very smart. And he tells the story of how he saved the consul's life. And he proves it with that big seal on his ring. Um, and then he asks the question, what has become of my mother and my sister? It is not my duty to keep track of prisoners. Find them, Miss Sella. Restore them to me and I will forget what I vowed with every stroke of that oar you chained me to. I am not the governor of Judea. I can do nothing without gratis approval. Then get it. I will come back tomorrow. 
Don't disappoint me, Masala. He leaves, and Masala goes, uh, go find out what happened. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? This is, the, this is the first time in the whole movie where Judah legitimately has an upper hand on Masala in power. Right. Yeah. And we go down to the dungeons. Because mm-hmm. he knows, because he fears Quintus Arius, because he fears Quintus Arius, yeah. who was at a higher well, station. And I think he fears Judah. Of course. Yeah. But, um, but definitely, without without the backing of Quintus Arius, this wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, of course not. Yeah, he goes. We go down to the dungeons. It's uh, Drusus is Drusus. I think. Yeah, Drusus. Yeah, goes down. His assistant. He talks to the head jailer, who says, well, "I haven't seen him in three years. Who, who knows? Yeah. You know." And there's this moment where they say they're in the east section, lower level, and there's a look of, yeah. "Oh, lower level." Yeah. Um, I don't know what's in the lower level, man, but that's lepers, not where man. I want to be. Lepers, man. And they go down and down, and it's kind of drippy and dank and looks like just a horrible place. We find the jailer, and the jailer says, oh, yeah, they're alive. I know because the food disappears. And the fact that they can barely open the door, because mm-hmm. it's almost rusted or sealed shut with muck, and mm-hmm. it's just a real sign of how nasty this place must be. He, he moves in a beautiful shot as, as he moves in with the torch and the yeah. light and then a musical sting as he sees them. Mm-hmm. And he backs out of the room and says, lepers. Yeah. And then Drusus takes the torch and he goes in and the same musical sting. It's like, oh no, take them outside of the city and release them. Burn out the cell. Mm-hmm. Lepers are scary. Yeah. In the construct of this film. And I think when I was a kid, I still, this freaked me out. Oh, sure. This is very upsetting. Well, Steve, I, I have psoriasis. Psoriasis mm. is a very, very, very mild right. case of leprosy. So a wait, lot of. Wait, what? Yeah, it is a very, very mild case. I'm going to have to end the podcast. No. <laughs> it's not contagious or anything, but it is hereditary. It is through the blood. And the Latinos suffer with this or eczema. It's a very, very big thing in our mm. culture. And it is some, and it skips generations, so you never know who's going to get it. So, and it can be very, very uh, horrible a condition oh, sure. to have. And I have a very, very mild, which I'm very fortunate about. It's only in a couple of spots, and so it's not anything huge. But I've seen some terrible, terrible right. uh, uh, pictures of people with runaway leprosy or runaway psoriasis, and it is essentially. A very a mild case of leprosy. So there is even more of a connection for me in this oh, movie wow. in that moment. So. Well, and in this time, you know, leprosy was a real thing. And oh, they yeah. Were, and, and what happens, we see later in the movie, of someone, you know, throwing rocks at them to keep them away, that was really what happened. I mean, think of the lack of compassion for illness yeah. at this time. Well, they don't understand it. Yeah. Uh, we go back to the house of her, and these two cloak figures kind of run inside. They, they're, they see Esther, they hide, mm-hmm. there's a cough. Esther kind of goes, who are you? And they say, don't come any closer. Esther, it's Miriam. Yeah. Um, and, and, and there's this horrible thing of Esther wanting to come and embrace them. And they want to be embraced. Yes, of course. But no, stay away. You have to stay away. Um, and she says, we are lepers. And again, the musical sting. Mm-hmm. Like, this is clearly handled. And, and, and the, her their big faces, eyes. Yeah, yeah, their faces are cloaked. Yeah. Um, and they ask about Judah. And she tells them that Judah is alive. And Esther wants to go tell Judah, and they say, tell no one. Yeah. Or really, it's mom yeah. who says, Tirza, I think, would like to talk of course. to Judah. But mom is like, no, we are going to the Valley of Lepers. We won't return. Don't tell Judah. Well, isn't that what a mom would do? Yeah. I don't want to inconvenience my son. Let him live his life thinking that we died, and he doesn't ever have to deal with having seen us like yeah. this. Yeah. And. Of course, then who should arrive at that moment is Judah. And he strides in angrily. And you can still yeah. feel the masala on him and all of that rage. Mm-hmm. And they hide. And there's great eyelight, which is just that little sparkle yep. in someone's eyes as they watch him. You can't see any of their faces. Mm-hmm. Um, and they ask, as he goes by, and they ask Esther, has he changed? And she, and she says, no, he's not changed. He's not changed. Mm-hmm. She lies. He has changed. Yeah. Or um, she's telling the truth that he hasn't changed because he's still seeking vengeance against Masala. And she saw the last, the last he heard of him was that he was taken away by. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. know. No, no, I definitely think she's, I guess, okay. because for her. I'm not trying to change your mind. I'm just, yeah. She, cause she sees that darkness in his soul that she mm-hmm. wants him to let go of. Mm-hmm. And she's trying to tell them that he's happy, that he's okay. Right. And he's not okay. Right. You know? Um, and they force her to promise not to tell him, yep. which she does. And they exit. 
Mm -hmm. That's a heavy promise because we're about to see it in the next scene because we go to the next scene and Judah is talking to Simonides and saying Masala is going to free them. Um, and she says, you can't free them because I saw them. I saw them. Saw them? Where? When did you see them? They were dead. That's pretty, pretty harsh. Yep. A pretty... And she says... Oh, Judah, you have come to the end of your search. It's over now. Over. Judah. It's over. Judah, forget, 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 Miss Allah. Go back to Rome. And Judah goes outside and he he, he touches the mezuzah and, and, and just sobs. And you can see he's rejecting his religion. He's rejecting God in yeah. this moment. And he, he looks up and we hear the revenge theme. You know, and we know who he's become. He has become vengeance. Yeah. And he strides out. And we reach intermission. My God. Yeah. We're just at the intermission? Yeah. <laughs> Look, we knew this was an epic. <laughs> well, that's what we think of Act One of Ben Hur. And of course, we always want to hear what you think. You can reach us on our website at Cinephiles, C I N E F I L E S. You can subscribe at iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, tune in, a whole bunch of other places. Please leave us a review on iTunes. They mean so much and they really help the show a lot. On YouTube, leave your comments. Uh, if you want to suggest a movie or interact with us in other ways, we do special audio clips. Go to patreon.com slash the Cinephiles. Um, and as always, you can reach me at SR Morris. John, where can they reach you? Uh, you can always reach me at the Roca says on Twitter and Instagram. And, you know, Steve and I want to do more of these Patreon conversations. So maybe if you're a patron, suggest some topics you'd like yeah. us to discuss for 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. And, and Steve and I will gladly oblige. And, and by the way, they don't know, just have to be about movies because there's all sorts yes. of topics that come up in these conversations about history and culture and food and science and mm -hmm. philosophy and evolution. And and relationships. And relationships <laughs> and all this stuff. So we're happy to talk about all that stuff. Absolutely. And uh, I think that is it for this week. We will see you next time with Act 2 of Ben-Hur on The Cinephiles. Cinephiles.